We're back with a special edition. We have a very special guest and a special deluxe edition to talk about. As you see on the right here, it is the one and only Billion Dollar Babies, the sixth album by the Alice Cooper Group, and our special guest, the one and only bass player, songwriter, backing vocalist, Dennis Dunaway. Dennis. Hi, Jay. We got some inflation here. I see it's up to a zillion dollar baby now. Well, it's been a few years, you know. <laughs> My gosh, we're going to have to take out a loan with the uh, Deutsche Bank or something on this one. <laughs> Hell. So the vinyl is three discs, one of the original album remastered, and then the live recording spread out over two discs. And that was recorded April 28th, 1973, the year of the release of the album from Houston, Texas, the Sam Houston arena. Wow. So I know there was a little bit of delay in getting this out. That's uh, they, they've gone the extra yard with the uh, packaging and the snakeskin cover and all that. Tell us, uh, tell us some of the bells and whistles inside this besides the audio. Well, first of all, the cover, the snakeskin texture is really nice. It's, it's different than the original one. They've stepped it up. Uh, they spiffed it up, and it's really nice. And um, just the the weight of the package, you know, the vinyl is great. And then you've got this practically a book inside written by the legendary Jan Uelski of Cream Magazine, who interviewed uh, all of the surviving members and Bob Ezrin about our memories about each and every song that's on the album. And it's so well written. You start reading it and you can't stop. You have to, you know, it's eight pages long. Yeah. And um, and anyway, the, the real standout for me is the remastering because this sounds better than, than it ever has. Yeah, I know the remastering is somewhat of a, a mysterious thing. Uh, it's obviously not a remix, but obviously, these high-end mastering engineers know how to get in there and do something, give it a special treatment that it never had before. Right. And the technological advances give them the ability to really, it's almost like a remix in a way, because you can hear things that you couldn't hear on the original. So they can bring out you know, some instruments, maybe bring out some highs or add a little bottom to it and kind of in, enhance the experience. Exactly. And I love when you mention add a little bottom, the bass sounds massive. <laughs> wow. You're like, finally, finally, guys. <laughs> my, my time to shine over here with my mirrored bass. You, you know? know, at one point, Bob Ezrin, the producer, uh, he gave each of us a t-shirt. Mine said more bass, you know, and Michael said yeah. more guitar. And he said, now you guys can just shut up while I'm trying to do this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've, I've heard of projects where guys go in later in the evening and kind of put the faders up on their guitars or make the bass a little louder and guys come in the next day. Everybody's kind of messing around, uh, outside normal business hours so to speak <laughs> well we never really had that luxury because man we would get in the studio and have to knock it out fast you know we were putting out two albums a year pretty much that's insane uh, to think about that now you know touring is so big you could tour for two years after releasing an album back then you you know making the albums was a bigger priority to the label than the touring right uh, well, you know, the Beatles set that bar high and the concept was, you know, don't let anything die down. You want to stay in the, in the news, in the public eye, you know, so as soon as, and, and it was all had to be balanced, you know, because you didn't want to put out a new single while another, uh, single was still had some traction. You didn't want to kill that yeah. run. And you so you wanted to have something ready, but not, uh, cut it short. Well, as right, as soon as that one had had it start going down the charts, then you wanted another one to pop right in there. So not only did we do two albums a year and we wrote 
the majority of our own material. I mean, Hello, Hooray was a cover song that the rest of them we wrote. Yeah. And uh, we also were the only band that would do, were doing two shows to go with those albums per year. So we were nonstop. There wasn't any downtime for anybody to sneak in the studio when nobody else was there because we were all there all the time. <laughs> Amazing. So we have, of course, the reprint of the billion dollar bill. And of course, that um, exquisite picture of the band members all in white and uh, baby Lola in 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 there. Um, t- talk about who shot that and where the baby came from. Uh, that was David Bailey uh, in London at his studio. And uh, Lola, Lola's mother, Carolyn Pfeiffer, uh, worked for Derek Taylor at the time, but she had worked for a lot of celebrities and she worked on Fellini's Eight and a Half and Dr. Zhivago. And uh, her job was to tell us when we went to a some kind of a function, promotional thing, she would tell us who's who in the room and who we should talk to and what we should say. And... Uh, uh, when we decided we wanted a baby for the picture, then Lola was there. <laughs> uh, so uh, David Bailey uh, had the session was set up on a Sunday morning, and we had to get all of that American cash on a Sunday in London. And that was really difficult, uh, but we pulled it off. And uh, Cindy, Neil Smith's sister and, and my wife uh, of almost 50 years now, ha- uh, had uh, uh, stayed up all night to make those white satin outfits that we had at the last minute decided we needed. Amazing. Now, you guys never heard of um, theatrical money? Nobody heard of prop money at that point? I mean, fake fake money is used in TV and videos and movies all day long. Who well, who had the brilliant idea of well, it's got to uh, be real money. Like anybody's going to know. It was against the law to have a photograph of real money back then. So that was also an issue that had to be ironed out. And I believe they uh, were able to talk uh, to get around that because the the dollars or the $20 bills or $100 bills weren't uh, photographed straight on. And it they were still wrapped in a, a piece of paper to keep all bundled together. Uh, so uh, we were allowed to do it after all. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we're here in Hollywood. I can go get a billion dollars fake money here in 10 minutes, you know. It's uh, it's crazy that you went to that that effort. And, of course, we heard the, uh, we heard the stories of the, um, and I know it was from a previous album, but where you had the uh, traveling billboard going through London with uh, Alice's naked body, per se. What album was that for? That was uh, that was for the tour that we did uh, in 1972 when we played at Wembley. Okay. And we wanted to make sure that we sold it out. Was Killer and, Killer the album that was out? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, when people say Killer era, they're thinking of when the Killer album was out, and the band was already done with Killer. And we were already writing the next album. So it's, and not only that, but uh, albums would be released later in in England, the earlier albums. So, oh, wow. Killer, so we would be promoting Killer in Britain. And as soon as we got back to the States, we would be go right into Schools Out. So uh, I believe it was the Killer, yes, because this Alice's uh, private parts were. Uh, covered up by uh, the snake Kachina, the boa constrictor. And yep. so what happened is uh, Shep Gordon, Joe Greenberg, our managers, uh, 
did this. Uh, they hired this guy that had a billboard on a truck and had it accidentally break down right in one of the major uh, intersections during the business. Right, like Pic area. Piccadilly Square or something, some exactly. major thoroughfare. Exactly. And of course, we're looking at the news and there's helicopters flying around uh, filming it and it uh, and uh, and Wembley sold out. Wow. Well, you have to watch our other episodes for all those stories of dropping thousands of panties from a helicopter over the Hollywood Bowl and all those great tales. <laughs> what amazing um shtick, whatever you want to call it, PR magic uh, in the tales of the original Alice Cooper group. So uh, love it to death, killer, school's out, billion dollar babies, and of course, muscle of love in addition to the greatest hits albums. What a, what a string of records. So I know the vinyl kick is big. People are going to enjoy the new remastered sound on here. And uh, like you say, Jan from Cream Magazine interviewed all four of you guys, all four living members of the band, including Michael Bruce and Neil Smith and Vince, a.k.a. Alice, and yourself for these uh, for this booklet. Um, and Bob Ezrin. Oh, Bob Ezrin. Can't can't forget Bob. No, nope. <laughs> um, once once of Toronto, now of Nashville. Hard to imagine a Canuck living in Nashville, but uh, everybody seems to be uh, populating Nashville, Tennessee. And um, what amazing tales! Now, um, when did you guys have the chance to write these songs? And were these done prior to going up to recording, or did you guys have a cram session? Or some of the ideas were done, or was any of this written in the Michigan house? Uh, we wrote all the time. I mean, every waking hour it would we would have ideas. If we were in a restaurant, we would be talking about what we were going to do, or talking about ideas. Brain. It was just a a constant brainstorming session. The Alice Cooper group. Everybody. Somebody would say something. Uh, and then the other guy would try to outdo it. And then it would keep getting more and more fantastic until it either turned out to be an idea that we could afford to do or turn out to be just something that we would laugh about and move on to the next thing. But it was constant in on airplanes. People that sat around the band got an earful because we would be discussing what we were going to do on a song. Uh, a lot of it was done in station wagons or uh, by the Billion Dollar Babies tour. We had the the jet, our own jet. And uh, a lot of that would be, you know, goofing around a lot of that. But it would still be if somebody had an idea, then we would discuss it. And that's how those songs came together. And things like uh, late night jams, you know. People would come, other musicians would come over, like uh, in Detroit, uh, Mitch Ryder would come over and bring his guitar and we would jam into the wee hours. And the next morning we might, hey, we got an idea, you know, so that's how it went. That's incredible. And how would you catalog those ideas? Because now you got a smartphone or, or something like that, where they just handwritten down, anybody have a cheap little Radio Shack audio recorder. How would you catalog these things so you wouldn't forget them? Well, a lot of them went up in smoke by the next morning. You know, the idea would evolve and you would be trying to remember what it was the night before, but it would evolve and all of a sudden it wasn't the same idea anymore. It would evolve to something else. We had a tape recorder, but generally we couldn't afford tape or nobody wanted to stop working on an idea to set up the tape recorder. So we had very little of that. Bob Ezrin was really good at remembering what we had done the night before. Hey, wait a minute, Neil, you changed the bass drum part there. Let's get that back to where it was, that kind of a thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, Paul McCartney's 
was talking about how many things went by the wayside uh, because they didn't have a tape recorder. And and we looked at it like, well, if if it was forgettable, then it wasn't worth it, you know, and which wasn't always true. We lost a lot of a lot of really good ideas never made it to vinyl. Uh, but but the good ones were memorable. You would come back the next day and go, hey, yeah, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I remember that. I remember what I'm doing on it. So a lot but of it's it got to was... be frustrating, you know. You had a great dream, you had an idea, you woke up or you discussed it the next morning. You're like, what the hell was that? Man, I can't uh, believe. That's true. That's know? true. <laughs> that was a typical morning. I need more coffee. I can't oh, remember shit. what chords. It could, what... it could have been our biggest song ever, man. And it's in the ether. Uh, that's true. You know, and like uh, Keith Richards said, he 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 woke up the next morning and saw that the cassette tape was all the way to the end. So he thought, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I must have recorded something and he played it back and it was satisfaction, which he didn't remember writing. Oh, what a great story. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like that. You know, you we didn't have a cassette machine that was uh, handy at all times, you know, and uh, I do have a few cassette things from uh, when we were working on Billion Dollar Babies, some uh, me jamming with uh, Ainsley Dunbar on drums and Bob wow. Dole on keyboards and and me uh, getting them to help me record a demo of an idea to present to the band. So there was uh, there was a lot of that stuff that that I still have, and they are songs that could have developed into something. But you know, you uh, uh, you try you take everybody's ideas and usually if somebody brought an idea to the table uh i think that i i explain it like it was like tossing your heart into a pool of piranha because <laughs> neil looks at it more like uh hey we were all experts at what we specialized in and somebody would bring in a an idea and we would overhaul it like taking an old car and turning it into a cool hot rod, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of, everybody had ideas and it was, uh, you know, just this whirlpool of ideas. And, and we would be passionate about those ideas. People that, that didn't know better would think, Oh man, those guys are all screaming at each other, man, they must hate each other. No, there was never anything personal. It was always just, hey, I like this idea and I think we should try this. And we had a rule that if anybody had an idea, you couldn't you couldn't uh, give it the boot uh, because on a verbal description. You had to actually give it a heartfelt try and play it and then you could give it the boot. So and we would vote on it and there were five of us. So it would always be the majority wins. Everybody moves forward on that. No grudges. And, and that's how it worked. But if politics could be that easy, you know, we'd be moving a lot of things forward here. That's right. Amazing. That's how well, it's supposed to work. I know. Come on. Let's get to work here. Guys are hired to, for a job. But what history? I mean, we look back at this landmark album 50 years ago plus. And it seems like yesterday, you know, coming up in school, I remember uh, from schools out, uh, Billion Dollar Babies, what a time period. And uh, it just, you know, it stamps in your mind where you were, who your friends were, what you were driving, who your girlfriend was, where, you know, what your favorite uh, soda was, whatever, you know, it was just boom, just brings you right back. But um I gotta say it's aged gracefully. As you have, our special guest is the one and only co-founder, bass player extraordinaire, songwriting, and backing vocalist, the one and only, the secret weapon, Dennis Dunaway, the Alice Cooper group. And special shout out to your lovely wife, Cindy, and a special uh, memoriam to one David Liebert, of course, your tour manager and your keyboard player's name again bob bob dolan recently passed bob away Dolan, amazing 
um, the, the family, you can only imagine the jam session in heaven. And David might even have that magic briefcase up there. So it's oh. a party tonight, <laughs> you know, Dennis, we can't thank you enough. Always a supreme pleasure. Please blessings to your family and your lovely wife. And can't wait to see new music from the one and only Dennis Dunaway, double D himself. Please. Thank you so much. We shall talk soon. Okay, Jay.